It's my honor and privilege this afternoon on behalf of the Church and the 21st Century Center here at Boston College and the University to welcome you this afternoon to Historic Gasson Hall for a very special event. We come together at this moment to note the publication of the ninth book in the C21 Center series published in cooperation with the Crossroad Publishing Company. This series provides, for the building up of the church, substantive contributions to the many dialogues going on within and around the Catholic Church, addressing vital questions whose answers will help shape the church of this day and tomorrow. The volume that we introduce this afternoon is the fruit of the scholarship, commitment, and experience, first of Boston College University historian, Dr. Thomas O'Connor, and the 10 talented men and women he invited to put into print this appreciation of two centuries of faith, the influence of Catholicism on Boston, 1808 to 2008. In a moment, I'll invite the editor of this collection to share with you more about the book and about those authors who collaborated with him in its creation. But first, Acknowledging among us today the presence of many familiar faces, among them Cardinal Sean O'Malley, the Archbishop of Boston, and Father William Leahy, our own president here at Boston College, I simply want to note as we begin that in its essence what we appreciate and celebrate as we gather here this day is service, making a contribution in faith in the name of Jesus Christ to the good of the world. The Roman Catholic Church has striven to make that contribution locally for more than two centuries through radically diverse times and through profound shifts in culture and society. Dr. O'Connor, the editor of Two Centuries, has himself made an appreciable and appreciated contribution of his own for the last several decades in making accessible to generations of Boston College students and to the world at large the story of this place, this city, this community, this college. He's been rightly called the Dean of Boston Historians, and we're grateful today for his efforts in bringing this book to print with his collaborators and bringing it into our hands this day. So as we begin, please join me in welcoming Professor Emeritus of History at BC and University Historian, Dr. Thomas O'Connor. Your Eminence, Cardinal O'Malley, Father Leahy, my fellow authors, members of the Boston College community, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us this evening. The 200th anniversary of the Archdiocese of Boston, you'll have to admit, is truly a historic occasion, and one that is deserving of serious reflection as well as celebration. As a scholarly gesture, of congratulations to Cardinal O'Malley, Archbishop of Boston, on the occasion of this bicentennial event. Father William Leahy, President of Boston College, authorized the Office of the University Historian to undertake the publication of a series of essays by recognized scholars that focus upon the various ways in which the Catholic Church has influenced the life and the society of this Commonwealth over the course of the past 200 years. To provide an opening essay, we were very fortunate, most fortunate, in being able to draw upon the considerable talents of Monsieur Francois Gautier, the Consul General of France in Boston. Can I just introduce Monsieur Gautier here? It was Monsieur Gautier's task and pleasure to describe the fascinating career of Jean Louis Lefebvre de Chavreuse, who was the man who was named First Bishop of Boston in 1808. Despite what might well have been a disastrous collision 
of opposing religious cultures, the Chevrous years actually provided a surprisingly tolerant interlude during which the early Catholic Church was able to establish its roots. Who would ever have imagined that only 15 years later, in 1823, when Bishop Chevreris was called back to France to become an archbishop, who would have imagined that some 200 prominent Bostonians would sign an appeal to the French authorities asking them not to take away from them a churchman that they regarded as, and I quote, a blessing and a treasure in our social community. How this remarkable achievement was accomplished by Bishop Chevreris is beautifully explained by Monsieur Gauthier in his very well-written presentation. You really should read it. <laughs> Unfortunately, the tolerance of the Chevreris years proved all too brief. As Irish Catholic immigration greatly increased during the 1820s and the 1830s, all the old colonial fears about the dangers of papism were rekindled. As author of the second essay, which is called Papism and Politics, I have reviewed the course of church-state relations. First, during the 19th century, when Boston Catholics lacked any semblance of political influence. And then during the 20th century, as the increasing political influence of the church reflected the size of the Catholic electorate and the prominence of its public officials. By the closing years of the 20th century, however, financial difficulties, demographic changes, theological controversies, they all ended with the disclosure of clerical sexual abuse scandals. Among other things, this seriously damaged the very close nature of church-state relations upon which the Catholic Church had depended for over half a century to make sure that public policy would be consistent with Catholic moral values. Certainly a reassessment of these relationships seems to be in order as we move on into the 21st century. But even as Boston Catholics struggled to secure some measure of political expression, church leaders also had to respond to the needs of their seriously impoverished people. The Reverend J. Brian Hare, Father Hare is sitting right in the middle over there. Father Hare, who served as Secretary for Social Services for the Archdiocese, is uniquely qualified to analyze the development of Catholic charities in Boston. Father Hare explains how Catholic charities had started out actually as a series of very small and localized efforts during the 19th century, and then gradually expanded into a very highly professional organization that eventually, by the 20th century, worked with numerous state and federal agencies. In order to maintain their integrity, however, Father Hare insists that Catholic social agencies must find new and more creative ways of responding to issues resulting from the increasing religious and moral pluralism that has developed these days throughout the American legal system. Religious leaders in the early years were concerned not only with the physical welfare of their members, but also with the education of Catholic children. In their essay, Father Joseph O'Keefe, over here, <clears throat> Dean of the Lynch School of Education at Boston College, 
along with his co-author, Aubrey Schepner, describe how the parochial system provided the most sustained example of bilingualism and biculturalism for Catholic students in the Archdiocese of Boston. This system, as perhaps we all know and remember, experienced unprecedented growth during the 1940s and the 1950s. But by 1966, as a result of escalating costs, declining vocations, and changing demographics, enrollments in the Boston parochial schools suffered a serious decline. By the 1990s, according to Father O'Keefe, traditional native language schools had become virtually non-existent. And they were replaced by programs designed to accommodate the increasing enrollment of African American, Hispanic, and Asian students. Now, what these changes will mean to the traditional mission and purpose of parochial education is obviously the subject of serious reflection. As impoverished and illiterate outsiders in a city hailed as the Africa, the Asian, hello. <laughs> the city hailed as the Athens of America. The reason I'm laughing is I wrote a book with that title and couldn't remember it. <laughs> but in such a city as ours, Boston Catholics were generally regarded, at best, as lower class immigrants who might benefit from a basic education, you know, the ABCs, but who could never attain any respectable level of literacy. So it came as a surprise to many Bostonians, therefore, when a series of Catholic writers produced something of a golden age of Catholic literature. And this was in the late 19th century. Focusing largely on the influence of such writers as John Boyle O'Reilly and Louise Imogen Guiney, Libby MacDonald Bishop, over here, <laughs> I recognize you now, who is a Boston College PhD currently teaching at the University of Southern Maine. That's right, Maine was originally a part of the diocese, right? Libby analyzes what she calls a Catholic literary movement that received considerable recognition in its day, but never fully materialized. The people she writes about were professional writers who were also practicing Catholics. But they did not attempt to conform to a particular vision of what constituted, quote, Catholic literature. They preferred to let their religion naturally pervade their work in order to maintain what they called free intellectuality and creative gentility. Dr. Bishop believes that this brief literary renaissance flourished during the late 19th century but declined in later years when Catholic writers were considered more acceptable when their works conformed to some designated parochial purpose. Now, in the course of these essays, although I have not mentioned it specifically, but I'm sure you gather it, the Catholic Church in Boston has almost universally been identified as an Irish church. You wouldn't believe that, of course, but, <laughs> but it's true. In his essay, Dr. William Leonard, chairman of the history department at Emanuel College, points out that other ethnic and racial groups have also played a very important role in the history of this archdiocese. 
various white European ethnic groups, as we have seen, the French, because actually the church started out as a French church with Matignon and Chevreuse. But the French, the Germans, the Italians, all established their own national churches here, while small clusters of Catholics from Africa and from the Caribbean had also been a part of the early church. But it was just after World War II when the number of African Americans in Boston increased substantially. And Dr. Leonard describes how efforts to assimilate black Catholics into the archdiocesan structure were frustrated by the bitter racial conflicts that plagued the city during the 1960s and 70s. The increase in the number of African Americans in Boston became part of further demographic changes during the 1980s when newcomers from Central and South America, from Vietnam and other parts of Southeast Asia, rapidly changed the composition of the traditional parish structure. I quote, the face of Boston is changing, writes Dr. Leonard, who regards this as one of the most serious challenges facing the Archdiocese of Boston in the coming century. In addition to growing ethnic and cultural diversity throughout the Archdiocese, there has also been a significant increase in the influence of women, according to Carol Hurd Green, a member of the English department at Boston College who's seated right over here. Carol. Starting in the 19th century with small groups of religious sisters, she traces the careers of the leaders of various religious orders who established orphanages, directed secondary schools, and administered hospitals throughout the archdiocese. By the 20th century, Catholic women, both religious sisters and also now members of the laity, had become successful literary figures, recognized scholars, very energetic fundraisers, and founders of numerous colleges for women. Following Vatican II, Lay women have also taken on greater responsibilities within the church itself, serving as lectors, Eucharistic ministers, and even parish administrators. Beginning her essays with what I think is a fascinating series of what she calls, quote, disjointed fragments of early women's history, Carol Green has pulled together these fragments, these strands, to create a substantial and colorful portrait of the accomplishments of Catholic women in the Archdiocese of Boston over the course of 200 years. Over the course of these same two centuries, the nature of the Catholic parish and the role of the pastor, they too have also undergone substantial changes, looking at this story from the bottom up. When it was first created in 1808, the Diocese of Boston was, was immense. It extended all the way from southern Rhode Island to where, <laughs> to where Libby is now in northern Maine with indistinct boundaries, if there were boundaries at all, and literally only a handful of priests. In Boston itself, it was the laity who organized the first parish because there were no priests, according to the laws of the Bay Colony. 
and these people operated it in a somewhat congregational manner until finally a resident priest could be appointed. As time went on, the role of the laity diminished as the power and the powers of the bishops and the pastors steadily increased. By the late 19th century, the parish had become what the writer, uh, Father William T. Schmidt, who himself is a pastor of uh, St. Par Patrick's Parish in Stoneham, Father Schmidt, what he calls the parish became, quote, a natural extension of home and family. It was that close. It was the place with which every parishioner personally identified. I don't know about you, but my day and Father Schmidt's day, if somebody asked you, where are you from? Oh, you said, oh, the gate of heaven. You know, St. Bridget's, the Sacred Heart. That came first. They said, well, where's that? Oh, that's in wherever it happened to be. It was a personal sign of identification, and it went from birth to death. <clears throat> parish life, this kind of parish life in Boston, flourished primarily in the years between the two world wars. But after 1960, things began to change. A combination of financial problems, demographic changes, liturgical controversies, all of these things then were aggravated by the sexual abuse scandals. By the end of the century, as we all know, churches were closing, all parish boundaries were eliminated, the number of priests was declining, parishes were being combined into clusters. As Father Schmidt's essay comes to a close, so you must read it, the reader may get the sense that history has perhaps come full circle and that the Archdiocese of Boston may be assuming some of the same characteristics that were displayed 200 years ago. The concluding essay by James M. O'Toole, who is the Clough Professor of History at Boston College. Jim, where are you sitting? There he is over there. Right. My long friend here. Jim's essay is not only an impressive study of Episcopal leadership, but it's also an effective overview at the end of these other essays, an overview of the policies and the programs of eight prelates who charted the course of the Catholic Church in Boston over the course of two centuries. That's only four bishops in a century. Eight in two centuries. There are no four-year terms here. <laughs> And the fact that most of these Boston prelates had very extended terms of office, ranging now anywhere from 20 years to 40 years, Archbishop Williams. This meant that their contrasting personalities and their different administrative policies had very enduring effects on archdiocesan history. During most of the 19th century, lacking power and privilege, the early bishops had to depend largely on quiet tact and personal diplomacy in order to achieve stability and progress for the church. By the 20th century, however, the growing Catholic majority in Massachusetts permitted Cardinal O'Connell and then Cardinal Cushing to enjoy the political benefits of what some writers have called a triumphalist subculture for many, many years. But then financial burdens, racial conflict in the city, 
So some of these themes overlap. A decline in the number of priests, the closing of churches, and finally the abuse scandals undercut the close relationship between church and state and also weakened the trust of many Catholics in the leadership of the church. As Boston moves into the 20th century, Professor O'Toole suggests the future leaders of the archdiocese might well study the social and the demographic and the political changes that have taken place in greater Boston since the 1960s and assess their effects upon the traditional attitudes of the church and its people as they continue to plan and journey into the 21st century. So these then are the major themes that you will find in our book, which is called Two Centuries of Faith. And these are some of the talented men and women who have so generously contributed to this volume. The Catholic Church did indeed survive in the very hostile climate of early America. But I think we've taken pains to show that it did not merely survive. In other words, it did not merely exist. Catholicism grew, and it grew in size, it grew in numbers, and it slowly expanded in the influence of its religious beliefs and the significance of its moral values. Over the course of 200 years, it became a major force that would have been totally impossible to imagine back in 1808. The scholarly essays contained in this volume, I think, provide thoughtful and fascinating insights into the numerous ways in which Catholicism influenced the life and the society of greater Boston over the course of 200 years. In addition, however, in the process, these authors in their essays have also furnished what really amounts to a contemporary history of the archdiocese itself as it continues to journey into the 21st century. I hope that you all will enjoy reading the essays in this volume, and I thank you so much for joining us this evening for its formal launching. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. O'Connor. You've given us a wonderful sense of the treasures that are here between these two covers and perhaps convince you all that you'll need the book before you leave this afternoon, as he, with great gentility, uh, brought forward at different points. He also has done us the gracious favor of, in fact, introducing many of the writers in the book who are with us this afternoon. They'll be with us afterwards for the reception, the rotunda, and will be I'm sure willing to uh, engage in conversation on what they've written about in the two centuries of faith. Professor O'Connor mentioned early in his remarks that the genesis of this book, and it is just to say, is found <coughs> excuse me, in the appreciation of Boston College's president, Father William Leahy, for the place the Catholic University holds within the Catholic community as a whole and in living in positive relation to the whole church. That living in positive relation is revealed most obviously in the relations between a Catholic university and the local church. Father Leahy has evidenced a recognition, a commitment to that living in positive relation always since his arrival here. This book, celebrating 200 years of archdiocesan life, stands firmly in that lineage. I'd invite you to 
warmly welcome now our President, Father Leahy, to address us. I would like to say a few words today. I have the very happy opportunity to be here and to present to Cardinal Sean a copy of this book. And one of the great things about being a president, when you have wonderful people like Tom O'Connor, a member of the class of 1949 around, is Tom is the kind of person you can invite to do something and he jumps right to it. That is not rare in the life of a president, that someone jumps right to it. And we have not only Tom to thank, but also the authors of the various chapters. They too responded generously and quickly to write about our archdiocese. And so we come here today, we celebrate two centuries of the archdiocese, two centuries of the Catholic community in Boston. And as we do that, we have an opportunity clearly to remember who we are and also to rededicate ourselves. And when I think of the history of Boston College, how it has evolved since it was founded in 1863, it's clear we come out of this Catholic community. We come out of the church. The church, the archdiocese has nourished us. And we, in our own way, have tried to contribute to the Catholic community through our graduates, through the work of our faculty, through the alumni of this institution. And so there is a great reciprocal relationship. Just as in the history of Catholic universities throughout the world, there is this connection with the church. Universities come out of the church. And we in our day have this opportunity to be here and acknowledge 200 years of the Archdiocese of Boston, all the good things that have gone on, all of the ways in which this community, this whole region, has been blessed because of the activities of the Archdiocese, its leaders, its parishioners. And as we come here, I hope we also draw from this experience that we share, that we have greater hope, greater confidence in the church, in our world. If you think of some of the gospel accounts we've heard since Easter, and I think especially of Christ appearing to the disciples in the locked room, and how he was able to penetrate that. We in our day sometimes get locked up in problems or we feel overwhelmed. And yet, through the church, Christ does come to us in its memories, in its sacraments, in our faith. He's able to break through all of those ways in which we may be bound, locked up. Seems to me this book reminds us so much about our heritage. It tells us about who we are. And we all know how critical it is to have memory. Because if we as individuals don't have memory, we lack identity. And so it is with our church. We need to recall our roots, our heritage, and build on that. And so we have, thanks to the efforts of Tom O'Connor and his fellow authors, a magnificent volume that I have the honor of presenting to Cardinal Sean, who is today's Archbishop of Boston. And we all can celebrate this work, this church, and this archbishop who represents all of us. So Cardinal Sean, if I could invite you to come forward and receive this volume on behalf of all of us at Boston College as a gesture of the bonds and connections with Thank us. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's beautiful. Thank you.
Thank you, Father Leahy. As Father Leahy has pointed out, we are graced this afternoon by the presence of the ninth bishop of the Diocese of Boston over these 200 years. Cardinal O'Malley has served as Archbishop of Boston since the summer of 2003, and he arrived at what can fairly be described, though I bow to the historians among us as I say this, at one of the most distressing moments the church has known in Boston over those two centuries. But in these almost six years, in the sharing of his faith, in his steadfast preaching of the gospel, in words and deeds uncountable of encouragement, he continues to work to rebuild the church. So I, I'd invite you to join me in a warm welcome to Cardinal O'Malley, whom I'd invite now to speak to us. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the Archdiocese, I want to express our gratitude to Father Leahy and Boston College for sponsoring this wonderful project and also for hosting our men's and women's conference this last weekend. It's, uh, uh, it's been uh, such a wonderful relationship that we have with the university that, as uh, Father Leahy said, is born out of the church. Ex Corde Ecclesiae was named for that very phrase, that the university has come out of the heart of the church. We are so grateful to Professor O'Connor for his fine work and the wonderful lecture that he gave at the library that was uh, so so well attended and, and also helped us to celebrate the 200 years of the life of our archdiocese. And we're grateful to uh, the French Council and all of the professors and others who have participated uh, in this uh, festschrift to mark the bicentenary of our archdiocese. Uh, 200 years ago, the entire Catholic population of our archdiocese could assemble, could have assembled in uh, Holy Cross Cathedral. And today we are almost uh, two million. And during these uh, this history of our archdiocese, our Catholic schools, thanks to religious sisters and, and the Jesuits and the brothers, have educated uh, over a million students. Uh, a half a million students graduated from our high schools. Catholic orphanages have taken care of 25,000 orphans. The Catholic hospitals have served almost four million individually. The diocesan planning office has provided affordable housing for 11,000 people. And today, Catholic social services, our Catholic schools, the parishes uh, are making such a, a, an impact on our local community. And our history has been like a long rosary, I say. We have our <laughs> joyful mysteries and sorrowful mysteries. But today, as we look back over 200 years, our hearts are filled with gratitude uh, for all that has been and also great hope uh, in our future and in the mission that the Lord has entrusted to us. I guess it's uh, not by accident that we stand here today under this uh, beautiful picture of St. Patrick, the patron of our archdiocese. Uh, that picture depicts uh, his meeting with the High King in Tara in about the year 320 when there was only a handful of Catholics in Ireland. And before he died, he had turned the Irish into an evangelizing country. Uh, and so it is in our own archdiocese. We have received a mission and we have to carry on that mission. We're so grateful for the wonderful uh, help that we've received from, from this community here at Boston College and for so many Catholics who've stepped forward to make the, the mission of the church a reality as we move forward. 
the beautiful deluxe version that you have given me of this <laughs> will certainly have a place of honor uh, in my office and will be a constant reminder of uh, the relationship that we have with this university and a sign also of our gratitude to God for all of those who have gone before us and on whose faith and hard work uh, we are the beneficiaries. So God bless all of you. Thank you.